a Dear Media original podcast. Nature was my savior and my natural inclination as a coping mechanism was just to create a safe space for myself, like a physically safe space. There was something about living in this forest now where I could go into this place, there were no people there. I was free from society's drama, all these uh, people, these crazy ass adults and kids. No one's gonna call me the N-word when I'm in the forest. I felt free. Even as a child, Deanna Van Buren had awareness of the built environment. Where we live, where we play, where we learn, where we work communicates a sense of safety and belonging, whether we realize it or not. Deanna was made to feel different from a young age. She did not feel a sense of safety or belonging in society or the world of academia, starting with grade school. The adage of, if you can see it, you can be it, was not an option for her. Not only could she not see it, she discovers that the majority of the spaces we inhabit are built by white privilege and men. Of 116,000 licensed architects, Deanna is one of 500 licensed black female architects in this country. That's less than 0.4% of all licensed architects. These numbers are staggering. It's a drop of water in a cup, barely perceptible. In case you're missing what I'm saying, that means there are hardly any and not enough black female architects. Defying all expectations and odds, Deanna is a part of building the world that we live in today. I'm your executive producer, Tracy Ellis Ross, and this is I Am America where we meet people who are redefining our identity, the idea of community, and the possibility of our country. These stories are beautiful, heavy, and light, and they allow us to reimagine and reframe what we know about this country. Today's story is produced by showrunner Nicole Hill, and this is Deanna Van Buren. In 1978, a six-year-old Deanna and her family arrived in Stafford County, Virginia, from Washington, D.C. The Civil Rights Act had passed just a decade before outlawing the practice of race-based discrimination, but as the Van Burens would find, not the culture. Stafford County was super rural and very segregated, and we moved into a white community, first Black family in that community. So there was a lot of um, hostility there on all sides. You're like, who are those people? Why are they living here next to us? Black folks are like, why are you living over there? You know, it was not, it was not a very welcoming and inclusive condition to grow up in. School was even more hostile. Parents teach their children to be racist. And so, you know, getting called the N-word and treated pretty badly in school by teachers. Being ignored, uh, treated as if I was bad, whatever I did didn't matter, being held back for not being as intelligent as the other kids. And my parents were like, yeah, it's going to be like that. Because my parents were born in the 30s, right? So they're Depression era babies growing up. And they're like, you just got to suck it up, buttercup, to some, to some degree, right? Just be good, be quiet, get into a good school. That's all that mattered to them. For her parents... The hostility and violence Black Americans face when integrating spaces was kind of to be expected. They'd both been through it, too. What they thought they were meant to do was keep their heads down, tough it out, just stay focused on their goals of building a better life for themselves and for their family. But Deanna is nine. Her classmates are being cruel, her teachers are, too, and none of it makes sense to her. And so she tries to get a little justice for herself. I like punch kids in the face a lot. I didn't just do it once. (laughs) With my little note taped to my top, Deanna was bad in school today. So I had some attitude, right? But, you know, when you're a young black kid in school with a little bit of attitude, we see what that looks like, right? Like it's, you're the one that's at fault. You're a bad kid. It's like, well, yeah, but that kid was also harassing me. I didn't start anything. 
But then after a while, it just got to be too much. You know, you get to be year after year of this. I think I just internalized it into a form of just self-hatred, right? I must be bad. There must be something. It's got to be true because it's just so consistent over this time. From the age of like nine to 10, where I just became much, I was very quiet. I lost a lot of my fight. I became a much more shy, internal, self-loathing, not confident in myself. The trauma just started to take its toll. She's experiencing depression, but she's too young to be able to put that feeling into words. What she knows is that she wants to be able to let her guard down and feel like she belongs. She wants to be somewhere where she's safe, both physically but especially emotionally. Luckily, growing up in rural Virginia meant that there was always one place she could go. Nature was my savior and my natural inclination as a coping mechanism. It was just to create a safe space for myself, like a physically safe space. I used to play in the closet. That was a big one with the doors closed and like make a world in there. But there was something about living in this forest now where I could go into this place. There were no people there. I was free from society's drama, all these uh, people, these crazy ass adults and kids. No one's going to call me the N-word when I'm in the forest. I felt free, you know. I could build my little things all day and go in there and just feel peaceful and feel calm, like being like a forest being and picking berries and being in my little hut, trying to pretend like I wanted to be a forager. So I like before I didn't eat anything because God knows I didn't know what I was doing. I'm gonna kill myself. But there was something about making a place both with food, with comfort, you know, the light would stream in. I loved it. I love to make other worlds. In middle school, Deanna learns the word for world builders like herself. A kid in my class gets up. I want to be an architect when I grow up. It was like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up day? And I, as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's what I've been doing. I didn't know a single architect. There were no architecture magazines around, like nothing like that. I had no exposure to it. It just, it just was there. Now Deanna has a goal and something to hold on to, becoming an architect. She hopes this career will take her far, far away from her hometown and to places where she can belong. In 1990, Deanna graduates high school, having earned a scholarship to a prestigious university to study architecture away from her hometown, which is a dream come true. But the school is the University of Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, where she's met with more of the racism and discrimination she was trying to escape. And then, she's accepted to an architecture program at the graduate level at Columbia University in New York City. She's going to study with some of the most celebrated leaders in her field in one of the most diverse places on the planet. In 1996, she makes her way to the top of the hill that Columbia University was built on and starts taking classes in a field that she'd loved since she was a little girl, in a city where her difference made her just like everybody else. This was an accomplishment worth celebrating. At a few friends, we would all go out downtown together the whole weekend and then show up back at architecture school Sunday night to do the work. And people had been there all week. Everybody else had been there all weekend. But my, my attitude is like, we're in New York. <laughs> Let's have some fun. I remember going downtown. This was in the meatpacking district before it was all bougie, right? And, and there was a club there. I don't remember the club, but it was like drum and bass. You know, there's something about drum and bass, breakbeat. And I went, and I didn't even go with anybody. I just went by myself. It was dark. It was smoky. They had the little fog machines going, and the lights were going. And I can't see the person next to me, but I know they're there. And I just was dancing my little ass off to breakbeat, you know? And it felt so good. I always felt like I was in another world. I loved going to clubs and music. It was almost like being in the forest again. <laughs> it was like a, a piece of heaven. And then I go back up the hill to Columbia into the Ivory Tower School. You know, I was the only African-American in the grad school program across all three years of the program, almost the whole time I was there. That was a shocker, just to be like, really? 
not even here. In architecture school, you have something called studio, which is the bulk of your time. But that's where your professor or critic for your studio, this is where like, we're going to design a, a, you know, a museum for rats, whatever. <laughs> it's like some rando program. And they'll sit with you and they're supposed to go to each student during that time and give them feedback on their design process and where they're going. Professors always have favorites. That's obviously not an uncommon thing, but all my professors are almost always white men. Almost always. I had a couple white women never saw a black or brown professor in all the time I was in school. So unconscious bias, of course, is at play and how you're getting the feedback and, and how you're being treated. So, you know, I can see that. Like, I see how that professor's not spending any time with me and talking to my buddy over here, who is also another white guy. You know, I, I see it happening. And I think to some degree, you, you do internalize, well, I just must not have talent. I must not be any good. But you also know at the same time, this shit is racist. And that's what's happening. Here we go again. I also, at that point, too, was by the time I was in college, the depression had gotten so bad. I was, you know... I was taking antidepressants. I had a therapist. So I was starting to get some real help for that. But, you know, there's a lot of trauma to, you know, we go through a lot of trauma in our lives. I certainly had. So getting away from this academy that had a really misaligned culture for me, like just the way they talk to each other, this sort of very patriarchal, rigid, egocentric, ugh, like, why would we ever hang out in studio all weekend when we can take this shit downtown? <laughs> I was able to go out and be party time Dee Dee. I could go, like, just, like, blow off steam and hang out with my friends. And so I didn't win no awards at the end of my, <laughs> at the end of grad school, but I had a good time. <laughs> I had a good time. Deanna parties her way to graduation, and then she lands a job working for a firm in London with a very wealthy clientele. She's going to be flown around the world to design new buildings. She's going to get to check out the renowned London party scene. And she hopes she'll find something that isn't the racism and the depression that's followed her everywhere she's gone. I've been on the road a lot lately, and I've been finding it harder to fall asleep. So I decided to try Open before bed as part of their January meditation challenge, and it has been working wonders. Open is a mindfulness app that's built to transform your life. You get to experience the power of combining breath work, meditation, sound, and movement to strengthen your mind-body connection. What I like most about Open is that it's so easy to integrate into my end-of-day wind-down routine. My favorite classes are the five-minute ones, but you can take a longer one if you'd like. There's also classes that help with stress relief, increasing focus, boosting energy, and of course, improving sleep. Doing it in an app allows you to track your progress and build a daily habit that will actually stick. You can experience Open yourself when you visit withopen.com America. Find the link in the show notes to practice for free. Go to withopen.com America to sign up. Deanna arrives in the UK in 1999. The first thing she does is try to find a place to live. I remember going to interview at the group house, a couple of them, and finding out they didn't want to live with me because I was American. They didn't want me in the house. I was like, wow, that's some, that's okay. I end up moving in with working class people from the north of England. They didn't care so much. And then started to see other kinds of racism towards uh, Pakistani folks. Also, a lot of queer, trans, homophobia stuff, too. You know, coming from New York, I most uh, half my friends were queer. And so now I'm in a situation with these sort of lads from the north of England. So there was just a, so many layers and complexities of new types of bigotry and different structures and different. Not that we don't have classism in the U.S., but it was very intense there. So I was constantly being directed towards me fighting folks who are directing it towards others. I'm like, no, I don't agree with that. It's not OK for you to say that to me. You know, like it was really interesting and constant. It was helpful, actually. I think even if you're being discriminated against for something else, it's not the original wound, right? It's not the original thing that you've been suffering from or experiencing. It's like, oh, wow, this is a whole new way 
to see me. And so my consciousness was just expanding, both in my own personal growth work, my exposure to so many cultures and countries and deepening into them. I just started to see myself as more than my experience as a Black American in the United States. And as she continues meeting people from around the world, as she continues having new experiences, she starts thinking of herself in more and more expansive ways. By night, she continues to be party time Didi. But by day, for the first time ever, she gets to be Deanna Van Buren, architect, to the rich and powerful. I loved it, you know. (laughs) And I would have all my drawings and we built models and tested the lighting. And, you know, it was really exciting. So, yes, I'm working for some of the wealthiest people in the world and, you know, doing bougie shopping centers. But that sort of level of creativity and cultural understanding and research is very exciting. But the depression was getting worse. I was getting bored with the partying. It didn't feel the same. It didn't feel like that freedom, liberation. It just felt heavy. And I would wake up the next day and, you know, instead of feeling like, man, that was fun, I would feel like, man, I'm depressed. I don't feel good. And I'd feel even more depressed because I'd been out the night before trying to run from it. So it just wasn't working anymore. I had a dark night of the soul, honey. I had a dark night of the soul. I'd had it before. It was not the first time, but where the depression gets to the point where you're having panic attacks, you can't leave the house, you... I couldn't go to work. I couldn't function. I was just in bed, you know, unable to move. It's like this, like you're in this totally dark space and there's tiniest little light there. And you're like, on your hands and knees groping towards the light because that's all you got and you, it, even that is hard and I had an awakening actually in that moment where I saw myself as a little girl dancing I don't remember how old I was in the vision but it was like a vision of myself as this joyous being dancing, moving and I thought oh you know this is not my true nature this depression This is not who I am. I'm that. And it became possible to recover, to not feel like this and not be constantly battling with this. Because at that point, like 28, 29, and I've been battling this since I was 10. So it's almost 20 years of constantly getting worse and better or self-medicated or whatever. That image was a little bit of hope, some light in the darkness, something that I could hold on to like a life raft to get to the next step. So I was just like, I'm going to recover because this is not who I am. I had some innate connection to spirit all my life that was there, whether I always knew it or not. I found an incredible therapist who was a Jewish queer Siddha yogi. (laughs) He was great. So I love that guy. And I was going to see him three times a week, but he was in training. So I only had to pay like 15 pounds, right? The universe supports us when we ask for help. Through this therapy, Deanna finally admits to herself that the racism she'd endured was traumatizing. The names she'd been called, the opportunities that were denied her, the ways she'd been made to feel like she didn't belong everywhere she went, it hurt her. And it impacted her sense of self-worth. Growing up in a context where you have no tribe, where you accept that the world is a racist place and that you are somehow deserving of that and are have no value, right? That you've got to heal from that because that's not true. These are all lies. And, I, you know, I think there's something... I know people have like way harder experiences than I have had, but I, what I will say is it is our natural need to be part of a group, to belong the innate need to belong and to know who are my people. And I just didn't have that, you know, that basic human need. So what a miracle to wake up to be like, oh, I can just heal myself with support, right? You don't do it alone. And so healing became the primary driver for me. 
more important than architecture, more important than anything else. It's like, I just want to be a healed whole person and that through that I will be free. I remember this one moment after I'd done the Hoffman process, right? So this is eight days of intensive therapy from butt crack of dawn till night. You're like hitting pillows and you're like crying, you're screaming, you're writing, you know, it's like you're in a group of people and you're really doing your family, you know, work around healing from childhood trauma. On the last day, I went out to the beach. This is on the coast in the UK, England. And I looked up and all of a sudden I could just understand that I was part of the universe, that everything was interconnected. I'm on this beach of rocks. They pick up the rocks. I'm like, I'm every rock on this beach. I felt huge. It was blew away any club experience. And I was one of the few people on the beach. The sky was blue. You know, the waters were calm. And I was like, this is who I am. After this experience, Deanna returned home to London with a whole new set of priorities around how she was going to live and work. So I wasn't party time Dee Dee, but I was still adventure time Dee Dee, you know, and I'm like just trying to experience life. Like work is an important thing, but I was much more interested in just having experiences like living. Now that I'm recovering, let's just do some more living in a different way. So, you know, I went backpacking for six months and I moved to Australia. I wanted to just expand my world beyond architecture, beyond this identity of a, of a job. At the same time, starting to ask some real questions like, I'm seeing a lot of poverty out on these mean streets. Why are we build? I don't really want to build shopping centers. I hate shopping. You know, like, what the hell am I doing? I'm coming into this now with a whole new set of eyes. Is this aligned with the new recovered whole person I'm becoming? Is this aligned with the fact that I don't feel good about the total gross inequity I'm seeing everywhere I go? That the only people who are dictating what our buildings look like and the environment looks like are white people with privilege? No way. <laughs> and I think I also was like, you know what? I can't keep running from America. Like I can't run from my experience being a black American in this country. I have to come back and fight. You know, I'm about as American as you can get, right? Indigenous heritage, enslaved people on this land, slave owners, immigrants. If I had a little bit some more Latinx and some Asian in there, I'd be the most American person on the planet. So I'm like, I'm from this. This is where my people are from. They've been here for a very long time. I have a right to be here. You know, I should go back and stop running. But I think part of to be an honest living overseas was I just needed to get away from this place. And it was just time to come home. Deanna arrives back in the U.S. in 2005 and settles in San Francisco. For the next couple of years, her work is pretty much the same as it was overseas. I kept working for developers and universities and houses for rich people and doing all this stuff, trying to find my out. So I'd gone back to the States in 2005. It was like 2007. I'm like, oh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Thank God we're going to go celebrate. I'm going to go to the Taylor Memorial Methodist Church in West Oakland. They were having a big celebration. I was so excited. And so I drove over and I walk into this super packed church. It's super hot, but like, oh, it felt like, you know, the South. You know, it felt like, yeah, people are singing and dancing. Angela Davis and her sister Fania Davis got up to speak. And I believe it was Fania Davis first really spoke about restorative justice. Restorative justice is a justice that heals. You could say that our justice system harms people who harm people to show that harming people is wrong. Huh? Fania goes on to explain that restorative justice aims to repair the breach in relationships that happens when one person hurts another. Participants in a restorative justice process are accountable and willing to explore the root causes of their harmful behavior to ensure that it never happens again. She shares that the ultimate aim of restorative justice is healing. My chest opened up, my hair stood on end, and it was one of those moments like, this, why aren't we doing this? This makes sense. Don't we believe people can change and heal and transform, right? Like, what one person does does not represent their entire life. Like, no, these are people that were harmed. 
They're acting out from that place of trauma, as I had in much lesser ways, right? And we all do it, right? We all do it in one way or another. And I found out, oh, we can heal ourselves. We can change. We can transform. It is true. And I became committed after like, I know I'm going to build spaces for restorative justice. That's what I'll do. Deanna found it very easy to empathize with others who'd been hurt by the same racist systems and cultures that had hurt her. She starts volunteering, helping activists design spaces for the practice of restorative justice that were healing, unlike courthouses and prisons and the spaces designed for the practice of criminal justice. By 2011, she'd quit her job designing bougie shopping centers. And by 2016, she'd co-founded her own firm called Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, where she partners with activists, architects, and community members to harness the power of the built environment to support the emotional and psychological well-being of communities impacted by mass incarceration. Since then, Deanna's worked with teachers and activists of color, to design light-filled mediation rooms in schools. She's collaborated with organizers to host pop-up events, where resources are brought to public spaces in underserved communities on customized buses and vans. These experiences capitalize on the joy that comes from people gathering together and sharing an experience in an open public space. It's kind of like the club. And she's built an entire center, Restore Oakland, the first of its kind in the nation, dedicated to the practice of restorative justice and economics. This 20,000 square foot building serves as a hub for community leaders and dreamers to collectively imagine new ways of ensuring that people of color, hurt by racist systems, never forget their value or that they belong. I believe people are our capacity to do amazing things. I believe we deserve a system of justice that plays to our highest selves, not our lowest selves, which is what our criminal justice system does. And between that and really believing that architecture should love us, right, that's my little love language, (laughs) like, you should live in beautiful space. Your space should be a reflection of your value on the inside, and that when we do create that, people will rise to that. My name is Deanna Van Buren. I'm an architect. That is an important thing to me. I'm a seeker, global citizen, black woman. (laughs) Deanna claimed the right to be who she dreamt of being even before she knew what that was. Black women are at the center of community building. We have to thrive in uninhabitable spaces, spaces mostly built by white privilege and men that tell us which direction we're allowed to grow and how free we are allowed to be. Despite these limitations, we dream and become. Informed by the safety and belonging Deanna found first in her closet, then in nature, in the club environment with Breakbeat, and with her therapists and more, Deanna became an architect for restorative justice And now she designs the blueprints for environments that are more welcoming, inclusive, and guided by love. In the face of insurmountable odds, Deanna thrives. And as a reminder, Deanna is one of 0.4% of Black women who are licensed architects. Hers was not an easy journey, but it is a triumphant one. Deanna's story reminds me of an Audre Lorde quote. Pain is important. How we evade it, how we succumb to it, how we deal with it, how we transcend it. As Black American women, there is inherited trauma, and we have the right to acknowledge it and release it. We are told that we can endure pain and that we must be silent with it, and so often, we turn that pain inward, believing that it is the price we have to pay to be an American, to belong. Deanna believed that lie until she did the work to rediscover that her true nature was joyous, determined, and free. 
where are you right now? Does your built environment allow you to feel safe? To feel free? I'm Tracy Ellis Ross, and I hope you enjoyed meeting Deanna Van Buren as much as I did. I Am America is a co-production of Dear Media and Joy Mill Entertainment. Executive producer, creator, and co-writer is Tracy Ellis Ross. Executive producer, showrunner, and writer is me, Nicole Hill. Managing producer is Asil Kibbe on behalf of Dear Media. Sound design and engineering is by Mitra Kaboli. Our theme song, Strum, is composed by Jesse Montgomery. Story editing is by Martina abrams Ilunga. Reporting and fact-checking by Siona Petros. And production assistance by Daniel Gonzalez. Executive producers are Adriana Ambries on behalf of Joy Mill Entertainment, Brian Dobbins on behalf of Artists First, Jeff Berman and Brett Boutier on behalf of Magnet Companies, and Jocelyn Falk, Paige Port, and Michael Bostick on behalf of Dear Media. The clips you heard in today's episodes are courtesy of Bioneers.